I woke up to some crazy blog post today called Project Rebalance by yours truly, Jagex. Let's dive into it and have a look at what this is all about. To preface, RuneScape is such a big game with so many different content from 20 plus skills, the activities to train, set skills, to the monsters, bosses, and the vast amounts of weapons and armor that you can use. And with such a wide variety of content comes the inevitable dread of content becoming no longer viable or some would say dead content. This is what balancing is all about though in a game like RuneScape. Jagex has a responsibility to bring all these content pieces to as close to a balanced state as possible so that as much content as possible is being utilized. Of course, there's no true way to perfectly balance all of this content, but it is something that must be done routinely. This blog addressed many of the popular complaints that's been piling over the years and also some newer ones that I didn't expect and how they plan on tackling these issues. Now, this blog is simply the declaration and the foundation for a long-term balancing project that Jagex is working on. What you see here is more of a summary and the individual parts will be discussed in depth over time with their own dedicated blogs and various things they said might change. My goal in this video is to give some background info on these subtopics and see if the issues mentioned and the solutions really make sense, but I will try to be as unbiased as possible and just cover these topics from as many player type lenses as possible. I also asked my viewers if they had some questions on the community post for those that read this already and wanted some clarification, so I will put some emphasis on certain things with those questions in mind. I'm going to cover all the topics in this blog and I'm going to order them based on what I think is probably the most pressing because I know y'all are busy and don't have time to go over everything. So with that being said, I'll cover the combat related balancing topics first. So Jagex listed some armor, weapons, and even prayers and the good old weapons like Osmontan's Fang and the Scythe of Vitter is at the forefront of this list for balancing. I'm going to go over the weapons first because these are definitely the most pressing. The weapons listed for balancing are the Scythe of Vitter, the Osmontan's Fang, the Elder Maul, the Void Waker, Inquisitor Mace, Soul Reaper Axe, and the Zaros Godsword. The issue with the Scythe and Fang is covered very in depth in this blog and probably is the most talked about topic out of all these balancing changes. Let's talk about the Scythe first. The issue with the Scythe of Vitter comes down to a few factors. It is a powerful slash weapon that is the rarest drop from Dito Blood Race 2, arguably the hardest raid in RuneScape. However, due to its modest accuracy, its use cases are more limited than something like the Shadow and the Twisted Bow. If you can use the Scythe on a foe with low defense and is a large target, at least 3x3 three three tiles or bigger, this also includes bosses that's defense can be reduced to very low levels. No weapon in this game comes close to its DPS if those conditions are met. But again, that requires two variables to be met, which is low defense and being a big enough target. So that limits its uses quite a bit in terms of where it's king. It's also one of the most expensive weapons to use because every attack, whether you miss or not, will use three blood runes and a vile blood, putting it over a thousand GP per hit. There's also the comparative issue to its peers. It's widely considered to be the melee mega rare in line with the best in slot magic weapon, Shao Tumikin, and the best in slot range weapon, the Twisted Bow, as they all come from their respective raids and are the most powerful and sought after items from those raids. However, though, the Shadow and the T-Bow have many more use cases than the Scythe because the Shadow's natural ability to increase your accuracy three times makes it really hard for it to not work well on a lot of monsters. And it also hits really hard. So, for example, with the Shadow, even if you have no idea what the Shadow is good at, you can just choose any random boss and the Shadow will probably mark it. Twisted Bow also works very well on monsters with high magic levels, and there are plenty of monsters and bosses that have 200 plus magic to make the Twisted Bow very powerful. To make the scythe more useful, Jagex wants to add a bit more accuracy to the scythe so that it's a bit stronger than its second best in slot rivals. And also, they want to create new content in the future where large creatures with low melee defense, probably in the slash and crush department, will be added so we have more uses. On top of it, if you swing all zeros on a hit, then that attack will not use the charge to make it cheaper. I do agree that adding more future content with the scythe in mind is probably the safest approach. However, Jagex has somewhat locked themselves in this commitment, so it's a given to expect near content to have bosses with the scythe in mind. 
Currently, the scythe is prominent in Rage 2, a bit of Rage 1, Nightmare, and a few other things. Now, in contrast, there's a weapon that's far easier to get but has way more overall uses and a lot cheaper, the Osmontan's Fang. The issue with the Fang is nearly the exact opposite of the scythe. When initially pitched, it was supposed to be a good stab weapon that excels on creatures with high melee defense because it has that 2x accuracy roll per hit. If the opponent is weak to stab like tanky dragons, like mithril dragons or necks, and a bunch of bosses at rage 3, then the scythe will dominate. Now this seems pretty balanced when pitched, but in reality it's also pretty solid damage overall, even if you're not fighting something that's specifically weak to stab and is tanky. It's only a bit less than that of a whip on most creatures, and most of you guys would understand how flexible and good a whip is. The Fang basically has that too. On top of its respectable damage, it has a slash style as well, with also the double accuracy roll. Psychologically, it feels extra powerful because it's hard to hit zeros on most creatures, so it is actually an incredibly accurate weapon on stab and slash. Recently, it's been antagonizing against more focused slash weapons like the Abyssal Whip, the Blade of Saldor, and the Scythe, with the Desert Treasure 2 bosses like Fardorvis and Du Succulus. An easy balancing change that they will do is make it so only the stab style gets the double accuracy roll and not the slash style. This change means that Fang will not compete with slash weapons on things like Fordorvis and Duke. The Fang will be plenty useful because it's still incredible on many bosses like mentioned previously, Raids 3, Next, and even things like Abyssal Sire and more. There are so many bosses and monsters that are tanking weak to stab, so the Fang will have no issue being useful even after this change. Overall, I think this is the best solution. Overall, the Fang and Scythe rebalances are pretty damn good. They are bang on with what I would have done for the most part, and a lot of my viewers, when I talk to them about these changes, pretty much agree with this, so I think this is as good as it'll get in terms of balancing those two items. Before I cover any more balancing topics, I want to quickly talk about a different and equally epic RuneScape topic, which is Jagex Licensed Merchandise by today's sponsor, Creator Crafted. Creator Crafted is a brand formed by some of the community's most passionate creators and members and I'm delighted to be working with these guys to bring you some amazing RuneScape products. These products are specifically created for RuneScape's most diehard fans. Their main offerings are LED signs of RuneScape's most iconic items and concepts. They're crystal clear to see, durable, and the LED lights add another level of aura to your gaming environment. Check out my Iron Man, by the way, LED symbol from Creator Crafted that I have set up in my room. It really reminds me of why I love this game. The iconic Iron Man helmet brings good vibes and memories. As you can see, the LED light is quite powerful as it can illuminate my room on its own, giving me that cozy ambience. The Iron Man logo is very clear and easy to distinguish. They also have high quality RuneScape theme mats as well, a best in slot upgrade for your gaming setup. Get your hands on these fantastic and limited time goodies right now because they have their holiday special going on so you can get a big discount. Hold on, there's more savings. If you use my link in the description or type in the code RICE10 on checkout, you can get these amazing products for an extra 10% off. You gotta buy them quick though because they are limited time and sell out quickly. Thank you guys for listening and back to the balancing topic. Before I cover the other weapons, Jagex threw in a super left field suggestion in this same topic that demands a more urgent look. Jagex also mentions wanting to get rid of zeros upon successful hits because currently you can still hit a zero if you rolled a successful hit. So instead of rolling a successful hit based on a range of possibilities of zero to whatever your max is, they think making a successful hit from one to your max is better. Jagex's reasoning is because hitting zeros is really frustrating, especially at the early levels. Even if you hit a successful roll, let's say your max is one, that means half the time your successful rolls are zero. And it's nice to know if certain specials attacks actually landed like Saradum and Godsword. Okay, on to the other weapons. They are proposing reducing the guarantee hit on the Void Waker special attack. They didn't say by how much, but I would assume maybe reduced to 80% or 90% of the time instead of 100% hit rate. Their reasoning is because 100% land rate makes it difficult to add more variety in future special attack weapons, and that is definitely true. I think it is a fair change and it wouldn't hurt the use cases of the Void Waker that much. You would still use it at mostly the same places like Raids 3 and various tanky monsters like Nex. Although I do not think the Void Waker change or rebalance is a pressing issue, 
and they could easily leave it alone for quite a while. Now, they want to buff the Elder Maul, but didn't quite explain how they want to go about it. Most veterans agree that such a rare item as rare as a Twisted Bow should be better. I agree, of course, but it is hard to universally agree on how it should be buffed. Personally, I would make it the best weapon at Tecton where it just gets a special buff fighting that boss, or maybe a bit more buffs inside chambers in general. My reasoning is because Jagex has already made special cases where Fang in the Shadow, for example, is even stronger in its respective rates than the outside world. Shadow, for example, is four times more accurate and raises your magic bonus four times instead of three times. And also, the Fang's accuracy roll is more than two times inside race three instead of the usual two. Although Sight does not get a bonus in Theory of Blood, it is still the dominant weapon in TOB. Buffing the Maul inside Raids 1 wouldn't make it too overpowered either because it's a fair consideration as it is an isolated buff, not a game-wide buff. Personally, I do not think Elder Maul is a pressing balancing issue as it never really had a significant cultural impact in RuneScape. I would like to admit that it is impossible to make every endgame item super useful, so I wouldn't be hard-pressed on fixing this one. Jagex wants to make the Soul Reaper Axe more useful, and yes, this weapon, I absolutely agree, needs an immediate buff. The Desert Treasure 2 requirements and the Iron Man style grind to even make this weapon should warrant this weapon being better than it currently is. It takes 4 pieces from 4 different bosses to make and you cannot even sell the pieces individually as they are not tradable. So you have to make this weapon from scratch regardless if you are an Iron Man or not. And not to mention this item is on average about 3000 Desert Treasure 2 bosses to even make. That's 100-200 hours of grinding for an Omega niche weapon absolutely not worth it right now. This weapon is supposed to be the highest single target melee DPS in the game on small medium sized creatures. However, it has a charging mechanic that's super annoying to use and if you don't do the charging mechanic, then the axe kind of sucks. In order to gain that level of DPS with the charges, it has to be charged 5 times through 5 attacks and you must maintain the charges too by not being idle and not switching the weapon out. Each charge drains 8 hit points and gives you 6% more damage, which is why it's so big. The theoretical best in slot uses here for this weapon are mainly for Dorvis and Slayer melee training. However, in its current janky ass state, it is hard to justify using the axe in those places even. Most PVMers would find the Soul Reaper axe difficult to use at for Dorvis and probably won't be able to beat their fang times with it consistently. The amount of attention required to keep the Soul Reaper charges intact is too much for a laid back to moderate activity like Slayer. To give you an example of how frustrating it is to use, if you stop attacking for even 6 seconds, you lose 6% of your damage as it will drain a charge. And for added annoyance, gaining a charge back by attacking again will cost you 8 life points. This is overly punishing as someone that has used this weapon extensively at Fardorvis for 8000 plus kills. I can confidently make a few suggestions to make this weapon work properly in the places that it's supposed to. The first change is to make the charges not drain after 6 seconds and instead you should only lose a charge every 30 seconds of not being in combat. Another option is to make it so that you don't lose charges for a minute of idle but if you exceed a minute of idle you'll lose all your charges that you have. These solutions will make it way more viable because now you have more breathing room to look away for a bit and also, if you were to boss with it, you actually would have time to eat. If you eat too much right now, we're using the Soul Reaper Axe, you actually lose the charge because you are not attacking, which is kind of ridiculous. Sometimes you're forced out of combat too, due to a boss mechanic like running away from blow or being sent to the maze by Sodasek. Currently, you lose a lot of charges just because of these mechanics, but with these changes I propose, you won't have a problem with that. And secondly, instead of draining 8 hit points per charge, it should be 4 instead. Losing 40 hit points to fully charge this axe is so stupid. A 20 HP loss for charging it for more power is way more sustainable and you'll still feel like you're trading something for power. This weapon could be such a good second best in slot option behind the Cypher Bossing and BIS Melee Slayer if the changes were made. I'm confident on this. Jagex wants to nerf the effectiveness of the Ancient God Sword special attack because the healing power alongside the damage power of the special is too strong. So the spec has two forms of damage, right? First one is just your special attack boosted damage. And then the second one is the passive 
healing effect, which hits your opponent for up to 25, and then you'll heal the 25 as well. They didn't explain the issue well at all with this weapon. I just assume they mean in PvP, the Ancient Godsword special is too strong because being able to hit 50s and 60s and then also deal an extra 25 damage to your opponent and heal you for that 25 is overkill. I can see that. Now, for the PvPers, you need to comment below and tell us if this item is truly overpowered because I don't know. There's no way that they're implying it's too strong in PvM because right now is a nice side special weapon at best mostly for staying longer at places like for Dorvis or Cerberus, where the monster does guarantee damage. All I can say is I've used this weapon extensively in bossing and it's by no means overpowered at all. I think this one weapon is fine as it is. In fact, it is still underused for how good it is. Nerfing it would make it even less used than it already is. Jagex wants to buff Inquisitor Maze because it's relatively more expensive than Rapier and Blade of Saldor and far too niche. It did not clarify any further, but I will fill in the picture for you. The mace is basically a rapier or blade of Saldor, but for crush. But lately, they haven't introduced too many crush weak bosses or monsters, and oftentimes, Scythe out DPSs the mace we're supposed to be good at, because the Scythe has a crush style too. Nightmare Boss 2 as a whole, which drops the mace and the armor that goes with it, is pretty outdated in terms of its place in general progression. Inquisitor used to be best in slot melee armor, just barely before Torva, and the Harm Staff was also BIS magic weapon, again just barely, before the Shadow. Nightmare as a whole needs some sort of revamp, especially in terms of its rewards, because most of the rewards are completely usurped by far stronger items now. And also the boss is still one of the hardest challenges in the game, but most of its drops now have very little use. The issue is far bigger than the maze, and Jagex needs some serious time to consider where Inquisitor and Nightmare and just in general all the drops as a whole should fit in this game. Should Nightmare remain near their content, like just niche endgame content, or should they revisit this place as a whole and give it some new life for people to grind? Now let's talk about non-weapons. Jagex wants to nerf the Occult Necklace because it gives a 10% magic damage, which for its price and rarity is completely unparalleled to other magic gear that gives magic damage like Ancestral and Tormented Bracelets. For example, the Occult Necklace is close to twice the magic damage of all three Ancestral pieces, 10% of the Occult versus 6% of full Ancestral. But the Ancestral set is in the hundreds of mils and is way more rare, while the Occult is under 1 mil GP. They want to redistribute some of the Occult magic damage to some other gear or future update. They haven't said what yet, but I do agree that the Occult is definitely a bit too strong for what it's worth. Even having it at 6% damage would be amazing for the price and time investment in grind for it. I've had conversations over the years where many would be cool with distributing some of that magic damage to Augury Prayer as there is no magic offensive prayers that give damage yet. I'm not too hard pressed on the occult rebouncing but I would say I'm mostly for it. I just hope they find the right spots to redistribute maybe like 4-5% to of the occult's magic to something else. Jagex wants to buff some of the lower level offensive prayers like superhuman strength and improved reflexes and so on. This makes too much sense as currently those prayers based on the math does pretty much nothing for you since the percentage that the prayers give you is often too low to give you an actual DPS boost. At least if your account is at that stage where that's your best prayers. They didn't say how they would fix this but if they can it would be neat. But personally, I've never really cared to use them, and I feel like I really hear this being an issue at all. If anything, it's more of an OCD fix, just to spruce things up for the looks. These prayers are so low level that most players would outlevel the need to use those prayers anyways, and end up using the tier 3 prayers, because everybody wants to get protection prayers, and once you get them, you're never going to use those tier 2. You're going to use like at least ultimate strength, um, eagle eye, things like that. I do not think it's worth their time to spend bouncing some of the lowest level offensive prayers. I'd rather they dedicate bouncing real issues first. That's all the items and prayer bouncing stuff covered. We now go to the next topic, which is, in my opinion, the most controversial new bouncing subject Jagex is thinking about, and that is the potential additions of new styles of defense for range and magic. So for those that never researched things like how stats and combat works in old school, there is this basic idea you have to understand. Kind of like Pokemon. I think a lot of you guys probably play Pokemon, right? Whenever you fight a monster or a person, how well you can damage your foe is based on your overall accuracy and damage using a certain style versus the opponent's respective overall defense against that style. 
So let's say you're using a melee weapon on slash style. Well, the opponent's slash defense alongside their normal defense stat will play a role on your attack's ability to land. For melee, there's a few styles. There's slash style like scimitars, crush styles like maces, and stab style like daggers. But for magic and range, it's just magic and range defense. That's it. For magic, there's technically different weapon forms like a wand or a staff, or even different elemental spells. But when it comes to damage calculation, it's just all magic. There's longbows, shortbows, javelins, darts, and so many more things for range, but it's all just treated as a singular range offensive and defensive stat, range. So there's definitely room for expanding the breadth of range and magic weapons horizontally if they included more sub-defense stats for range and magic. One of the biggest pros of adding more magic and range stats is that Jags can easily create more weapons and armor for players to enjoy without them directly clashing with each other in terms of usability. If they make creatures that are weak to, say, crossbows and more resistant to other range styles, then crossbows get more love. If they make creatures where they're weaker to certain elements like air, then wands and staff that autocast elemental spells will get more love. The biggest con of this change is that there would be more niches to remember and the game gets a bit more complicated. But to be honest, I don't think this con is nearly as bad as it sounds because having more sub-defense styles for range of magic logically makes sense and wouldn't be confusing. The cost of wanting new content always comes with a bit of learning, but this wouldn't be confusing to learn at all as it's super intuitive and we're already used to it with the melee styles. I have one major concern regarding this idea and one major question regarding this idea. My personal issue with this balancing proposal is that Jagex did mention they want to see stat rebalancing to a bunch of old monsters, and I don't think that's a good idea. The main reason is that a big part of what makes old school old school is that the iconic monsters are for the most part as you remember them in those original years. In this case, how you remember killing them effectively. This would just make a lot of already established weapon use cases becoming less meaningful. I am also aware that Jagged says they wouldn't really be changing the defensive stats of old creatures by much. They just wanted to nudge it on the right direction of what the right style should be. I just think it's kind of unnecessary at that point. Might as well just keep it what we have now. I do like the idea of having more diversity with magic and ranged weapons, but I would like to see that being implemented on new things, new monsters, and more recent content instead. For example, if they decide to go ahead with adding new magic and ranged defense stats and it passed the poll somehow, every monster would technically have the new range and magic style resistances. But for the old monsters like Gargoyles though, I would like them to make sure that all those new defense stats have the same resistance. Gargoyles currently have a magic defense of 20. If they decide to say have 4 magic defense styles for like the elements like air, water, whatever, then just keep them all at 20 so it's still the same. There are a few cases of monsters being logically weak to certain styles like fire giants obviously should be weak to water right but in the game currently it doesn't matter what magic you use on fire giants you're pretty much going to hit them just the same but in the case of fire giants it would probably be okay to give it a bit more of a pronounced weakness to water style just for a logical sanity if this new change passes however most old monsters in the game don't logically have specific range or magic weaknesses so for the most part most old monsters should not be tampered with if these stats were added tldr though if they add more sub stats to magic and range defense please try to keep it to new monsters or recent monsters and i think it's a win-win for game balance and player enjoyment and lots of opportunity for new things to come out that isn't dead content i do have one big question regarding this topic so jagus is specifically wanting to add more magic defense styles and more ranged defense styles to monsters which is pretty similar to melee right but the thing is with melee we have so many more stats actually than just defense right we also have melee offensive stats for like crush slash and stab for both mosses monsters and also for players if you look at the equipment stat screen of the player right with our gear it will show not just like melee defense it shows slash defense crush defense and stab defense right and then range of magic is just one thing right but would it make sense though for us two players to also have like sub style range defenses too and sub style magic defenses too i know what i just said is probably quite confusing for some of you guys but effectively 
monsters and players when it comes to melee share similar stat formulas right we have melee defense for different styles and melee offense for different styles right but if they expand it to range and magic right now they're only talking about having that for defense for monsters so that's quite strange because you're missing 75 percent of what melee offers in terms of their variety of stats i think jagex probably on purpose just kept the idea of multiple defense stats for magic and ranged exclusively to monsters to keep it more simple and it would work on its own technically perhaps if this initial idea makes it to the game then they might in the future talk about expanding this idea to player gear stats as well to further allow more room for new armor and whatnot and also if the monsters that we fight ended up getting the expanded range and magic styles for their offensive stats we could do a lot with that in terms of like new mechanics or fights and like boss encounters what do you guys think another left field idea jagus is thinking about is revamping how run energy works in this game now they didn't go into detail of course other than saying it would be a massive undertaking and require beta tests if they did anything with run energy all right now we're on to our final big topic which is rebalancing skill related content and skills themselves like agility slayer thieving and mining this is all bundled together but i will summarize them based on the skills involved there's quite a bit of agility related things they want to look into such as rebalancing the xp of older agility content like brimhaven cores and adjusting the agility shortcut requirements level requirements from diary rewards they also want to look into adding more agility shortcuts i agree with all these points because a lot of agility content has definitely lost a lot of reasons to use them in 2023 they are for the most part replaced by modern things like the rooftop of course the prif dennis cores and things like hell sepulcher so the brimhaven course the old agility courses like the wilderness courses needs to be adjusted right now the new courses are simply more rewarding xp and you also get martial grace a simple solution could be just to make the old agility courses fit in between the rooftop levels and also give you marks of grace i feel like marks of grace is oftentimes the main deal breaker for a lot of players right now rooftop courses are offered every 10 levels so the old courses could fit in between those levels like 25 or 35 and so on they want to make the brimhaven course provide better xp for the effort which is fine maybe they can offer a faster tagging system to receive tickets so you don't have to wait so long between tickets to keep it more interesting and of course have to readjust the uh, ticket xp but i think that might be a good solution i think agility rebounces is worth the effort and won't take too long to make happen jagex also wants to rebalance some of the old thieving npcs so that they're more viable in today's times and also things like thieving stalls it's similar to the agility issue with the old agility content when I mean old NPCs, I mean things like the heroes, the watchtower guards, I guess, and like paladins, and also stalls like, I guess, the silk stalls, and a bunch of those other random ones like spice stalls. This is a tricky fix because there's a lot of old content like Pyramid Plunder, Sorcerer's Garden, Arty Knights that actually provide amazing experience to this day. So if anything, they might need to improve the bad thieving methods in ways that's just not XP. The old content that's good for thieving as mentioned already covers such a vast array of thieving levels from low level to basically 99. Thieving is also a lot faster to train than something like agility. What I mean by that is it's easy to create more content for agility training in a linear fashion due to it being slow so people are always excited to move on to the next spot. But thieving is just too fast so you only need a few methods to get to where you need. I feel like tweaking the sucky methods to provide better non-XP rewards might be the better way to go about it. Jagex also wants to rebalance Slayer, especially the Slayer task system. This one is definitely a must fix because you still get bullshit tasks like Metal Dragons from a level 70 Slayer Master. This is often one of the biggest annoyances of starting Slayer for new players. One could say that it builds characters, smash your head in, killing Steel Dragons at 85 combat with the Dragon Skimitar, but I don't want players to suffer as bad as we had in this case. They want to find better task sizes for certain slayer creatures overall i think this is a great thing to look into and shouldn't take too long to adjust the super soul monster should naturally have a less assigned amount and if people want to extend them there could be options for it in the slayer reward at a maybe cheaper cost and the higher level monster should definitely be moved up a bit more to higher level slayer masters like dordo it just sucks getting like iron steel dragons 
from like mid-level Slayer Masters, you know? I, I feel like nobody ever wants to kill those that early. Jagex also wants to explore mining the same way as the Jodian Thieving. So there's a ton of mining content nowadays, and I'm willing to bet many of you guys don't even know most of them. Just in Zaya alone, there's two solid options like Volcanic Mine and Blast Mine, but all of those are quite unknown and seem daunting to even do, even if you know about it. It is more so the culture of mining that is making these content not popular, not that they suck. Players are used to AFK mining like Motherload and Star Mining. Also, players are used to mining where it's simple and done on your own. Like back in the day, if someone was mining your rock, you get pissed. I think that ideology still exists. I'm not sure how effective it is to revamp things like Volcanic Mine because in truth, they're already some of the best XP in the game once you learn it and have one or two more people. And Blast Mine is actually quite solid XP combo with the GP that you make. I think it's still worthwhile because I'm sure it will attract some people to learn the content and make it easier for some of the people that are doing this content. Salcano also falls under a similar issue. It's quite rewarding in terms of resources and profit and you do get a bit of XP but it requires a group and it's also above average effort. You gotta do a lot of clicking and timing. Mining content is definitely in disarray because there isn't really a standardized way to go about trying out all this content. Most players that train mining just do one or two methods all the way to 99 and that's it. Getting players into the habit of trying out all of this other content is truly a tough thing to solve. Overall, with all these skilling changes and rebalances, I think it's a good start, but honestly, I feel like there's one huge thing that they never address properly when it comes to skilling as a whole. I think the skilling page, when you click on a skill to show you what you can do at every level, is honestly dog shit because it doesn't really tell you the pros and cons of each of the different methods when you really should be knowing things like that. For example, maybe if they redesign the skilling info page in a way that lets player know what's low effort or high effort content wise would be easy to implement and also super helpful in getting players interested in less popular methods. Right now, all the skilling page info shows is just based on the level that you unlock something. But that's not useful at all because you have no idea if any of these new skill unlocks even fit your preference. Let's say someone is actually down to do skilling in a non-AFK way. But there's no way for them to know that Volcanic Mine or Blast Mine or Sokano is actually a good choice for them. They need to look it up on Google or ask players online for all these important things that really should be in the skilling info page. Honestly, a redesign for the skilling page for all these skills like agility, thieving, mining, and whatever is going to be so helpful for players. Perhaps a little info box too for when you click on a content piece in the skills page which summarizes these things a bit further would be nice too. What do you guys think about this? Should Jagex redesign their skilling in-game page so that it is more expansive and more descriptive to help players figure out which content fits them best in their respective skills? And finally, we're on our last miscellaneous balancing stuff. So they want to rebalance some of these silver jewelry teleports. And I think that's fine. But for the most part, I don't really care too much because I feel like we already have so many travel options. But there's a few areas... Where like if you're doing Cluiser, for example, repeatedly, you might find it annoying to get to. But I think it's okay, you know, to have some areas that takes a bit longer to travel to. Jagex also wants to make the Got This Rest Tea production process a bit easier to do. I think that's a good idea because Got This Rest Teas are actually really, really good. If you don't know what they do, they effectively heal you for 20 per item. But the thing is, when you drink and heal from it, you don't get any cooldown. So it's really good for like more advanced PVMing. But right now, it's super annoying to make. Alright guys, I've covered pretty much everything on this balancing blog. I might have missed a few things though. But yeah, they're going to expand these subjects in the future. And I won't be covering them all, but I will be covering some of the more important ones again if it seems big enough. Feel free to discuss amongst yourselves in the comments below as there's a lot we can talk about. Thank you guys so much for watching or rather listening to this super long video. Don't forget about the holiday sale going on at Crater Crafted for their awesome LED and mouse mats. Make sure you use my code RICE10. Have a good holiday guys.